I'll just start by saying hello, do a little housekeeping. Hello to my wife who's down the hallway watching me on YouTube. Hello to all her friends and family in the Philippines who promised to watch me while I'm talking. Uh, now, uh, this talk is sort of an entry level. It's a, it's a basic newbie thing on Postgres. Um, let's get the slides up and running. There we go, bring this down. Uh, there. There we go. So um, what we're talking about is working with Postgres uh, as a JSON document store. So again, uh, thank you for, for a little bit of introduction. Yes, I've been in computers for a while. Um, I got interested in Postgres in the early 2000s from an open source conference. Uh, I met uh, some of the core members and uh, I saw uh, a lot of potential. A lot of potential that was in the early days and uh, I'm more or less stuck with Postgres because I never got bored it's, it's it's a fun environment for me and I've never stopped learning so you the people that are listening uh, for me here in Seattle it's sunrise it's still dark outside maybe it's sunset for you or it's in the middle of the day um, your background it helps if you've got a background in JSON yes you don't need to have complete knowledge you can either know Postgres or you know JSON. This is about introducing you to the idea of using Postgres as a backend, as a, as a JSON document store. Now, everybody knows the capabilities of Postgres, but sometimes we just stick to the traditional stuff, the basic stuff of what you can do. So this talk is just to walk you through. Half an hour really isn't enough time to talk about what you can do on how you can uh, really explore it. So, I'm going to try to give you an introduction, walk you through, and hopefully give you a little bit of references at the same time. So we're, we're breaking this talk into about two parts. One, the overview, how it's capable, how JSON is put into a Postgres. Again, it's not technical. It's, it's a little bit of an overview. And the second part is some examples, a little bit of scenarios as to what exactly you can do, how you can do it. Um, it's, it is quite deep, it is quite complex and complete, the, the JSON implementation in Postgres, but it's amazing how much work you can do with just a little bit of knowledge. <clears throat> so a little bit on definitions. I've taught a lot over the last few years and I really do believe in, in, in basics, in newbie stuff, uh, because I find out it's the newbie stuff that gets people caught when they're doing large scale migrations or upgrades or troubleshooting. You have to know the really basic stuff. Sophistication comes with time, it comes with experience. But if you don't know the basics, you can't solve anything. And let's go with the definitions. Uh, everybody knows these definitions, DBMS, RDBMS, GDBMS, maybe not. Database management systems, that's everything in the background. That's your NoSQL, your SQL, your um, unstructured, you're structured, you're embedded systems. It's an organization of database systems that solves a problem, that gets you data, gives you information, insights. The relational, that's our traditional. That's, that's COD's rules. It used to be 12, now it's 13. It's our relational database systems of MySQL, Mongo, Postgres, of course. And our final definition, which I wanna use in this context. A general purpose database management system. That's what Postgres is. The term has really started coming out these last couple of years uh, of, of the general purpose. And basically what it means in this context is you take a database system and basically you can use it for anything. Is it better than anything else? We're talking about a general purpose, not a specialized tool. A lot of people have come to Postgres for one simple reason. It gets the job done. They are specialists in another technology. They have an idea, they want to implement it. They want to use their skills as quickly as possible. Postgres is standards. At the beginning, a long time ago, those standards weren't there. People didn't, didn't have it. So they programmed, they specialized on certain technologies and developed as quickly as they could. Now the education process is such that you've got a good grounding and people have gravitated toward Postgres because 
there's virtually no learning curve when they get out and start being productive, when they start earning their money. You can do anything with Postgres, given the time and given the resources with a specific task. Let's go to JSON. JSON is a document standard. It is very complete. I encourage you at the end of this talk, download the slides. If this is recorded, re look at the recordings again. This is just an entranceway, a doorway into learning how to work with Postgres. All I'm doing is just showing you things. These slides, the links are effective. The, the PDF uh, on the bottom of the slide here, for example, is clickable. You can go straight to the protocol. Um, I like this kind of stuff. It helps me understand. And I hope I can invite you to get in, involved with it too. Some of it can be boring, but when you get it down, it's really incredibly useful. Postgres has implemented uh, JSON incrementally over the years. And at this point, it is quite mature. As you can see, there are five essential parts that Postgres manages JSON, that it implements JSON. We've got our data types. We've got indexes, the ability that, of course, in all relational database systems, or in this case, a document database system, to accelerate queries through our large data sets. The JSON path type is fully implemented and is watched closely by the community. It's updated when there are changes. Operators and functions, it's the greatest strength of Postgres. The ability to create function calls and to reinterpret it as symbols or what we otherwise call operators. So let's look at our data, uh, data types. We've got two kinds. When Postgres first started implementing the JSON, it went very, very simple. We've got here in our table, three columns. It's our traditional relational table, but look at the second and the third, my doc and my doc B. These are data types of JSON and JSON B. The you could arguably put a JSON document in a, a varchar, you could put it in a data type text. There's absolutely no problem. But the advantage, especially when, the first, when we first put the implementation in JSON, is that it validates your, uh, your data. It validates whether or not it's well formed. And that really saves a lot of problems. It, it's really quite cool. A lot of people, when they do their validation on the database systems, instead of putting all the error trapping, they just let Postgres do it. They just configure the tables nice and tight and they trap those error exceptions. Now the difference between JSON and JSON B, JSON was the first generation, the iteration, and is still quite useful, still quite common. The JSON B data type, on the other hand, is allows you to use the operators and the function calls. It allows you to query a data store efficiently. And it is the data type where you can apply indexes specifically designed for a JSON document. These here on this slides are very basic implementations of uh, how to use our primitives. The, uh, as you can see here, these, these are, this isn't um, rocket science, it's very nice. You notice that we're using the Postgres double colon to cast everything into nice clean JSON. So whenever you insert, whenever you read something, all you need to do is just to cast it. Again, simple validation, you can just use the JSON. You can see in this case, we're using primitives. We have Boolean flags, true or false. We've got our arrays and we've got the subsets. We can actually create compound documentation. JSON B specializes in containment and existence. These examples here demonstrate, and again, we're casting. You can see here, we're now forming the basis of our query. If you're comfortable with Postgres with your standard traditional queries, you can see that it's a very, very slightly into using JTOC, just the way you quote it, just the way you compose it. If, you've, if you're coming from the branch of working primarily with JSON and you have a little bit of query experience, this is going to be so easy, so fast to pick up on. As you can see, you've got your queries. The, 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 when you do a JSON query, when you're searching, you're using the operators. The at greater than is the most common. It's equivalent to the where criteria. You can see that on the left and the right side, they are both cast as JSON B types. When you work with this, if when you have tables, you're not gonna have to cast it because it's already gonna be there. Indexes, 
B-tree is the most common index used in Postgres, but it's not the only one. When JSON was incorporated, we looked at the kinds of indexes we could use and we said, hey, GIN is the best option for putting an index up, uh, against a JSON data type. So in this case, what we've got is all you need to do is you can create your index. Now in this particular case, you can see from the table, we have our table, my table, we've got uh, a column, we call it uh, for, for the my doc B, and we're applying in this particular example, we're applying the index against the entire column. But you can break down columns to go deeper into dig deeper into specific hierarchical elements and methods inside that particular document. It's, you can make it as deep as you want, as thorough as you want. Take a look at our first example. Here is a nice, neat, tidy implementation of JSON. You can see that you've got your curly braces, you've got your double quotes, you have your key values, and at the bottom there you can see your tags. An example of an array. When we execute an explain on a, on a query or for a table, and we don't have an index applied, you can see how it comes out. It's a sequential scan. Uh, very simple. Now you notice the query planner is effective, and I encourage you, as you develop your tables, as you develop sophistication, don't try to do everything all at once. Do it incrementally. Build out your tables, and then start playing with your indexes. And as you can see from here, you'll see that when you do your queries, it's gonna be a sequential scan. After applying the index, take a look at it again, and you'll see if you've done it right, hey, you've got an index. Nice, easy way to find out if you're gonna get a high performance table scan or a query. The JSON path type at this point in Postgres, I believe is about as mature and equivalent as the current standards implementation. You can see that there are three semantics. There's the dot, the square brackets, and arrays. Now, the, the dot, of course, is member access. And for those people, again, who are more familiar with JSON, more com comfortable, you're gonna recognize the types. Now, at the bottom of the slide here, again, there are the links. You just click on it, you go to the Postgres site. I've been really easy on myself developing this presentation. I just took it straight out of the Postgres documentation. It is, bar none, the best documentation to learn how to get along with this stuff. Now, the square brackets, you can see here, again, implementation for arrays. Remember to keep a hold of the basics, what curly braces mean, what square, braces, uh, square brackets mean, what the dot means. They're all very consistent. The last issue, standard arrays in Postgres, they start typically one. However, in JSON, the standard is a little different. It starts with a zero. Watch out, you don't get trapped by that. Here's a little example. We have an array and we're looking for a particular element in the operator. In this case, you can see we're looking for the operator on the second one. So that would be zero, one, two, which comes out key value of C and Baz. Notice key and value are both enclosed in double quotes. This is a copy and paste. This is straight out of Postgres. Look, these are so cool on the, the number of operators here. Now, when you start working with it, keep it simple. Determine the basic operations that you want to do and then slowly get comfortable with it. In JSON, JSONB, there are three classes of operators. There are operators exclusively capable for JSON. There are operators that work in tangent with both JSON and JSONB data types. And then there are, of course, the third type, which is just exclusively JSONB. And you can see here, it's the conventional where criteria that you are familiar and comfortable with Postgres. Now less, less than equal, greater, greater than equal, et cetera, et cetera. Now we move on to functions. Now, in Postgres, as I said at the beginning, operators and functions, it's more or less actually the same thing. It's just reinterpreted. However, the way, the reason why we break it down, operators and functions is Postgres uses operators to help you compose the queries. When you want to compose a query, look at the operators. But the way we've put function calls, it's organized in a fashion to help you say, Oh, I'm going to translate. I'm going to go from one form to another. In this case, 
Function calls in Postgres have been implemented for the most part to go from a relational context and translate it to a JSON context or to manipulate the context in JSON or in the relational. It's, it, it is amazing the number of functions that are here. Start with the simple ones. Now here in this place, in, in this example, I just for, for fun, I put in three different colors, blue, green, black, just to separate examples. Take a look here. We've got three functions, two JSON, a rate of JSON, and JSON each. Take a couple, play with them, get comfortable. You're gonna find out you can accomplish quite a bit just with a few for your particular tasks. The functions are awesome. There is so many. JSON, wrote a JSON, JSON build array, JSON build object. Again, when you're confused, when you're not certain, referring to the standards, you go to JSON, you look at the references, you're gonna see the terminology is very close, very similar. It helps the learning curve. It just goes on and on and on. There are so many functions here to help you convert from one form to another. Here's a trick. You have a task, you have a problem. If you can express it, if you can explain it in about 15 seconds, the, uh, the famous elevator pitch, then you know you can resolve it. You can take your existing functions. They are there. All you need to do is to hunt them out and use them. The trick is to understand if you can explain it, if you can declare what you need to get done. All right, that's our little introduction. That's our part one. Now we go to our part two. We've got a scenario. Because of the depth, the extent, because I've only got a few more minutes left before we go on to the next speaker, um, we're gonna do it in two parts. We've got a set of tables, relational, we're gonna populate them. We're going to apply indexes, foreign keys, etc. And I'm gonna show you two little techniques on how to get that into JSON. One technique is a convenience format. The other one is a very clean format, a way that matches what you expect in a traditional JSON uh, document, the formatting. So let's get on with it. This is our um, SQL for creating five tables. Four of the tables are gonna be part of our sample database, our relational database. Our fifth table is our document database. Now, if you're reading the code here, look at the beginning, you're gonna see that I've added a little extra here. Um, these little extra things help because you may not know about them or it may help you jog the memory. We're gonna use an extension, PG Crypto. In our tables, you'll look in one of the tables that we've got here, it is table security. In this example, we're gonna put a username password combination and we're gonna hash the password. Now, as you know, the hardest thing about passwords is how to hide them, how to protect against them. And the proper standard you may or may not be aware of is you wanna hash all security, all sensitive data in such a manner that it is impossible to reverse engineer or at least that it's extremely difficult. In this case, what we're doing is we're gonna use a function called crypt inside the PG crypto and it's going to do a one-way hash. In this example, we've used the same use, uh, various usernames, but the same password. And you'll find in our example that those passwords are actually different. They look different. That's the beauty when you do it right. To validate, you have say like a, a cart. A person applies their credit card, they put in their um, credit card number and it gets hashed and they compare it to the system, to the storage. It matches, they do their purchase. That's how we know. Okay, so we've applied the extension, we've created a function and we've attached it here as a trigger on the table to translate to hash it. What's cool here is as we've created our tables, we've also used our little check constraints, social security numbers, only nine digits allowed, and it's only digits. In here, uh, address, we have a zip code. In this case, we're using five digits here in the United States. Our basic, again, we're validating it, prevent no alpha um, alphabets, uh, no letters. And let's move on. So here's what it's gonna look like. These are our four tables. We've got our constraints. Again, very traditional. So we're gonna convert this into a proper JSON document. Let's insert data. 
Now, in this particular example, we're just putting in two records. I've got insert identity, address, contact info. Insert into identity again, another record, address and contact info. And here I was a little lazy. I've just insert one common record. This is an array. It's username, password, username, password. And the password here is in the clear. We're just calling it my password. And we're gonna populate these two records. And this is the technique that we're going to pull it out. Now, <clears throat> when you're starting out, you're going to have these traditional tables and you wanna generate a, um, a JSON. So the easiest way is to perform a query. Get your records out, get your query out, and you're gonna generate a row. That row is our argument for this function called row to JSON. Now here, you see there are two implementations of row to JSON. The only difference is that little Boolean flag. That, if it's true, if you use that particular argument, you're actually gonna get a pretty format. Otherwise, if it's uh, API stuff, if you're just putting in, pulling out, putting in, you can use the first implementation. But if you like formatting, you like prettiness, you want colors, use the Boolean. This is our implementation. We're taking a query, we're using table identity, joining it to a table address, using column ID identity. And <clears throat> if you aren't familiar with this, this is called a common table expression. In these days, uh, the big reason why Postgres has become popular has been it, it's possible to implement ideas, solutions, uh, new products at a very, very fast rate. The old rules of having high performance, um, they're still there, but really the deciding factor is the person. Common table expressions make it possible to share knowledge, to share information on how something's done from one person to another. The most expensive facet in a project is the individual. The time they take to understand is expensive. Common table expressions are an excellent way of breaking down the steps of performing a query and explain how it works out. If you can, stick to common table expressions. It's very useful to help plan out your thoughts and other people that can understand and also catch any mistakes or errors that maybe you missed. So in this particular case, you can see the output in blue are two rows, are two records. Now this is kind of cool and it may throw you off. Key, value, key, value, key, value. But the key in this case, in double quotes, is F. F1, F2, F3. This is a convenience function. What this does is it arbitrarily allocates a key value. You can see when you look at the output and compare it to the query, the keys have been assigned according to the order of the column. F1, ID identity, F2, first name, F3, last name, et cetera, et cetera. It increments. It's a nice shortcut. So long as you don't get caught flat-footed, as long as you expect this behavior, you're cool. There's no problems in using this technique. And it's a very, very easy way when you want to uh, economize on the use of keys you're gonna know what the keys are because it's incremental and it's always with an F. This is the other query. Remember our table security? This is our array, username, passwords. Again, one, two, three columns, F1, F2, F3, and look at our passwords. That's the PG crypto. You can see here, they're the same passwords, but they're hashed differently. Very cool. Very, very useful. Again, I'd like to point out our row, I, J, K, A, in our common uh, table expression, that's how we identified the columns. And we converted it, we made sure it conformed to a row. Our argument to row to JSON, easy as pie. This is our second example. We went through the first, row to JSON. Now we're using two different function calls. You can see our common table expression. JSON aggregate, JSON build object. Take down the slides, copy it down, take a look at this. You're gonna see this will allow you to build up. Very nice and tidy. This is going to create a clean, proper conformant JSON document. 
Again, we're taking our combined forces, our combined queries, and we put it all together. We start out with our initial query, we make it into an aggregate, we go into C, we build an object out of it, and this last one, D, we take the other query. And then at the very end, look at the bottom here, concatenate. JSON is concatenated using the old fashioned traditional Postgres concatenation. Here's a couple of examples. I got about 10 of them here. So we do our query from our record document. That's what it looks like when it comes out. Second one, we're using our operators and we're going in and pulling out based on key values, our first names. Now in this particular case, let me bring it back here. Our key values, we're, we've arbitrarily written. Key value, column, key value, column, key value, column. We've named them, building the object. So we use them. Again, here's our username passwords, our combinations. In this case, we're pulling all the username passwords. We're going down. Notice we're going into the array. We're going after the first element, zero. We're using ordinary limit one because we've got two records. We just want the first record out. Again, username, password. In this case, we've got the combination of just one set. Going for the second element. And here in this example, we're going even further. Notice the drill, operator, JSON operator, key value. We drill down and down and down into the document. And here we are, a query that pulls out our addresses for all our records. And notice when you just do the records, no limits, it lists all the records. Each row is going to be a complete record. And there we are. Okay. And that's it. And I did it in 27 minutes. So any questions? So Robert, I am checking um, Slack now and I do not see any questions that came in from you. Um, but, you know, Robert, thank you for getting up early because I know this is early for you. It's a, it's a little bit early where you are, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The sun is just coming up. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, we appreciate you, you know, jumping on early. 